Hey everyone, really quickly before I get into today's stories, I just want to mention and let you know that these first four stories are new that you've never heard before. And the rest of the stories will be more than likely duplicates that you've heard in the past or have been featured on my channel before. If you're a frequent visitor here, just wanted to let you know that because I know there's going to be somebody to complain about it. So yeah, enjoy the stories and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Here's an additional story to my first one. It was March on the slope, while still in the depths of the Arctic winter, and the equinox approaching the day-night cycle was becoming more and more even. My flight to the slope was delayed due to a large blizzard, which shut down the Dead Horse and Kupperuk airstrips. I spent three days waiting in Anchorage until the storm cleared and we were finally able to fly. Landing at the Kupperuk airstrip, it was evident that the blizzard was more severe than we had initially thought. While whiteout blizzards are common, actually, snow accumulation is not. This storm, though, was a monster. Snow drifts several stories tall ran up against the house camping. Our work trucks and equipment were completely covered in snow, and it took a full day of digging just to get them out. As soon as the trucks were free, we were off to our first job assignment. No time to rest in the oil field. Traveling anywhere after a storm this size is a nightmare. To get to the work site, we had a bulldozer escort us breaking up any remaining drifts as we went. The dozer cleared our work area around the well house, and we began to rig up our equipment. It took a little time, but we were soon back to the normal humdrum life of Arctic oil well maintenance. Over the radio, we got a call from the bulldozer operator as he left, saying that he'd seen a giant black animal heading in our direction. He couldn't tell if it was a wolf or a big dog, but it was massive and moving erratically. In the winter, many animals aren't active on the slope. Caribou, musk oxen, and foxes are the usual wildlife you'll encounter out in the snow. The animals keep to themselves for the most part, but you learn pretty quickly to not look an animal in the eyes, if they approach you. This goes doubly for the white foxes, and I advise you to do the same. The grizzlies are hibernating. The male polar bears are hunting the area on the sea ice, while the females are denned up with new cubs. Wolves aren't unheard of, but rarely leave the Brooks Range Mountains a couple of hundred miles to the south. Whatever the operator saw, we would keep watch, but it wasn't our problem. It was a problem for the bear police. We went about our work, albeit cautiously. It's interesting to note that oil companies on the slope have private security officers who, beside being private law enforcement, also try to minimize encounters with wildlife. We refer to them as the bear police which is a cute name for a rather dangerous part of their job. These security officers are the only personnel on the North Slope, outside of regular law enforcement, that can carry firearms. Their primary job when encountering large predators is to harass them until they leave. This is done with beanbag guns or loud noises at first. When that fails, or the animal is unusually aggressive, lethal force is needed. We had settled back into our work and forgot about the wolf or dog or whatever it was. I needed to take a leak. I got out of the truck and walked back behind the well house to take care of my business. My crewmate came over the radio, telling me to get back in the truck. There was a wolf coming out from behind the well house where I'd just been, and he was pacing after me. I didn't look behind me, I just ran back and jumped into the truck. I'm not taking any chances, even if it was a crewmate playing a practical joke. Once inside I looked out, and sure enough, Trotting towards the truck was a large, black male wolf. He approached our trucks and plopped down in the snow in front of us. This wolf looked rough, even for wild animal standards. The right side of his face was mutilated and deformed, missing his right eye and most of his skin and lips on that side of his head. The wound exposed large, white teeth, giving him the appearance of a crooked, wide smile. He didn't appear to be aggressive, but he didn't take his good eye off of us. That one good eye was bright red in appearance. It was eerie. The way he sat there just staring, watching, waiting. We then radioed the security officers for help, and like a speeding bullet, they showed up 40 minutes later. That whole time waiting, the wolf never diverted his attention from us. If I hadn't seen him breathing, I would have assumed it was a statue. The officers arrived, took some pictures for the report, then began the process of driving the animal back out into the tundra. Truck horns didn't startle him. He didn't even flinch. Charging him with their truck didn't either. 
Then they took aim with the beanbag gun, hit him square in the ribs. The wolf let out a yelp, but didn't get up or move from that spot. The next beanbag hit him in the head, and that jostled him enough to get up and leave. Security told us to call back if we saw the wolf again. They seemed confident he would move on and not be a bother anymore. The sun was setting, and our job was still hours from wrapping up. Working a 13 to 15 hour day isn't unusual. You either get used to the long hours or you find another line of work pretty quick. I was running the computer equipment inside the truck. Weird data was coming back from the tools down in the well. They were blanking out, losing signal, or they were reporting data backwards, but diagnostics wasn't indicating any issues. To the computer system, everything was operating normally. I tried a few different things to fix the issue, but it persisted. One of the workers went out to the wellhead to check the gauges and the cables, trying to isolate the problem from there. He was outside for not more than five minutes before the night was pierced by a long, bellowing howl. This was immediately followed by the high-pitched shriek of our crewmate. Throwing the door open, I was able to catch a fleeting glimpse of a large dark figure running behind the wellhouse. Our crewmate ran past us and jumped inside, pale, sweating, and full of adrenaline. He tried to relay what just happened. Through his panting, he said he was in the wellhouse checking the cables when someone walked up behind him. Thinking it was one of us, he started a conversation with his back still turned. When he got no reply, he turned and was met face to face with a seven foot tall black wolf standing on its hind legs. It stood between him and the door growling. Without thinking, he flung his pipe wrench at the beast and struck him hard in the chest. That's when it let out a howl and ran off. Our crewmate was adamant this was the same wolf from earlier because its face was still mangled in that crooked half smile and one fiery red eye. Myself and the others on the crew had a hard time believing that he saw a giant wolf man. We had no doubt that he saw that wolf, but we reasoned that in his panic, he hallucinated that it was upright like a man. But we all encountered enough weird things on the slope to never count out the impossible. We radioed the security officers and told them that the wolf had returned and waited inside the truck. What else could we do but wait? I wasn't about to go out there and fight Satan's guard dog with a clipboard and a mouse pad. Every time we felt like things had settled down, we would hear a growl or something would push against the truck. Periodically, we could see something pacing in the dark just beyond the reach of the work lights. Even though we were inside a locked truck cabin, it was still a very vulnerable feeling. We were very much trapped. I'm sure, it felt similar to what divers experience inside a shark cage far out at sea. All this went on for an hour while we waited for someone to show up. Finally, coming up the road we could see headlights of three approaching vehicles. The security team had showed up, this time with actual rifles. Over the radio we told them what had been going on. You could feel their disbelief and eye-rolling through the radio. That sass and disbelief soon faded when we explored the worksite and found it covered in fresh large wolf tracks. The security team split up with two trucks headed out to search for that wolf, while the last one remained with us as we loaded our equipment and finished our job. We didn't hear or see anything else that night as we cleaned up, but we sure did keep our heads on a swivel. The security officers didn't find the wolf that night. A set of tracks left off the work site and out into the open tundra. The officers commented that the tracks looked weird. This was due to them only seeing the back paw prints in the snow. Last security truck escorted us back to the main camp while the others continued their search into the night. The following week of various reports came in across the oil field of people seeing this mangled black wolf during the day. At night, reports kept coming in of black beasts walking upright and harassing or cornering workers. Security always seemed to show up minutes too late. During this time frame, many of the Alaska native workers were getting nervous. One of our friends in the camp workshop was from Nuiksut, a small village just west of the oil field. He told us it sounded exactly like an Ijarak, a shape-shifting creature that can take any form of any arctic animal while it hunts. He said it was obvious as the wolf was a normal, albeit deformed, in the daylight but transformed into the upright monster after nightfall. The Ijarak are thought to be Inuit hunters that travel too far north and become stuck between the world of the living and of the dead. 
They transform into evil, deformed men with sideways mouths and eyes. They use their powers of shape-shifting to hunt other Inuit, especially children. The Inuit are very weary of wild animals for this very reason. A week following our encounter, the security team was able to corner the wolf on a remote worksite. It had attacked and trapped two welders in their truck. Both of the workers had superficial cuts through their snowsuits, but were otherwise fine. Having no other choice, the wolf was euthanized on the spot. Security shot the wolf once, and instead of dropping dead, it charged the officer that just shot it. The wolf took three more high-powered rifle shots before it eventually collapsed at the feet of the officer. Even then, paralyzed and now crimson snow, the wolf was still growling through its crooked, wide smile. And after several minutes, it finally succumbed to its wounds. The wolf's body was taken to the University of Alaska Fairbanks for dissection and examination. Outside of the facial deformities and gnarled appearance, biologists concluded it was a normal and ordinary wolf from the Brooks Range Mountains. How it got hundreds of miles from home and why it stayed on the tundra is still a complete mystery. I grew up out in the wooded country in Illinois, on a short dead end street 10 plus miles from a town, and there were seven houses in the area, spread out among two and a half acre wooded lots, or larger on each. There were no large wild animals. There aren't bears or similar large animals in this region, and people didn't meander out there or show up lost. Actually, lost folks or large animals wandering around never happened in the 20 years that I lived there so please keep this in mind. When I was a younger girl in my early teens, I had a good guy friend a few years older than me who lived right next door, Terry. Terry was allowed to go out with his friends much later than I was, and he would sometimes tromp over to my yard after getting home late and throw rocks from the gravel area outside my window just to chat. My bedroom was right next to that window. I'd open up the window and we'd whisper stories and generally talk for a bit. The second story window faced our backyard, and his house was to the side. I could see his house from my window over the shrub trees and walk the path to his driveway. I'd often know if he was out, because the light on his side door entrance would be off. One time during summer when my window was open, I heard a car in his driveway dropping him off. I was probably 14 years old, and it was around midnight. I heard Terry get out of his car and was talking to one of his friends. Soon his friend pulled away. I softly called out as loud as I could without waking my parents, asking Terry to stop by and chat. He didn't respond, as he probably didn't hear me. Then I came up with a not so brilliant idea to sneak outside and scare him. I'd spent many years in the woods, learning how to blend in and be silent. As kids, we'd often sneak around and scare one another. So I silently sneaked down from the second floor and head out my back garage door, which led to our backyard below my window which then led to Terry's house off to the side through that gravel area I told you about earlier. From there, we would move on to a well-worn path through the woods, about maybe 25 feet long. My parents had put in a gravel pit around the back of the house probably because nothing much grew there due to the shade of the oak trees. There were 14-inch oak rounds set out as an uneven stepping path in the gravel. If you stepped off the rounds, the crunch of the gravel or rocks would give you away. I picked my way expertly, silently crossing the log rounds facing Terry's house. As my eyes got accustomed to the dark, I didn't see him. Also, at that time, I heard the door of his house close and the light going off, signaling that he went in, likely to go to bed. I waited a bit, as I thought I saw someone move in the woods between our houses, but not on the path we'd always use. If you didn't use the path, there were wild rose and raspberry plants that had thorns, or very painful to walk through if you weren't careful. So I thought it was odd that he'd be in the woods and maybe he wanted to scare me like I was plotting to do to him. But I saw something human-sized and dark moving through the woods, slow, pausing every once in a while, just like me. It was coming closer and I definitely saw it, but it was strange in that it wasn't walking directly to my window to talk like Terry normally would. Therefore, I hunched down and waited in silence wondering if I could still startle him. In this moment, I still thought it was Terry, 
thinking he saw me sneak out and was now trying to scare me. I continued to watch the dark outline of a human figure moving. Then I would lose sight of it inside that foliage. It seemed to be stalking slowly, listening and checking every few feet while continuing to hide. So I whispered after losing patience one last time for Terry, but he didn't answer. I got bored of hiding and crouching so quietly, so I tippy-toed back to my garage door, went back inside, and silently locked up as I went. I snuck back upstairs to my room, right above the area where I was just standing and crouching. My window was open, and I definitely heard someone or something walking around the yard. Again, I whispered out for Terry, but got no answer. I then heard someone or something fall and grunt and moan pretty loudly in the window well, right below my window. It wasn't enough to wake my parents, but definitely loud enough that I didn't mistake it, and it sent a shock of fear right through me. If you aren't familiar with the window well, it's a semicircle hole connected to the house, dug out about three or four feet deep and reinforced with metal. It allows the basement window to be put in below ground level, and the hole lets some natural light in. There's no way Terry would have fallen in our window well. We had been playing hide and seek and many outdoor games for years since we were young and around that whole neighborhood. We knew everyone's window wells and house footprints like the back of our hands. That grunt sound sounded human, not an animal. It also pulled itself out quietly without a lot of thrashing. And that's when I realized this wasn't a fun game and that someone was out there and that someone wasn't Terry. I tried to look outside my window as best as I could, but there was a screen on my window to keep the bugs out, so I couldn't lean my head out the window to see the next wall of our house or anything directly below me. I then heard the crunch of rocks as whatever it was was stepping into the noisy gravel. Again, Terry would know where the log grounds were and would not step in that gravel. He knew my parents were pretty strict. He was good at being as quiet as I was. Whatever it was stopped, and I held my breath. I just sat there with my nose pressed against the screen, two stories up for probably half an hour. I never heard it, him, her, or anything leave, but I grew tired and eventually fell asleep on my bed that was next to the window. There are a few things that I'm certain of. One, it wasn't Terry. I asked him later and he said he went to bed that night when he got home. He also would have no reason to lie. Two, I'm pretty sure it wasn't one of our neighbors. I can't think of any reason a person would be there. We only had a few neighbors and only had two other houses. Out of those two houses, seven kids. Again, all these houses were spread out in two and a half acres per home. Three, there weren't any big animals in the area. As wooded as the whole area was, we only had some deer. They were hunted, didn't come close to any of our homes. Plus, any dog in the area would scare them away. So to that stranger that I saw in the woods, it's never ever me. In May of 2009, I had just broken up with my girlfriend of almost three years. We had moved from Calgary to Toronto and we were stuck living together after the breakup as we didn't know much people in the city yet. Needless to say, the situation was pretty stressful and upsetting. And so when a buddy of mine I went to school with at the time suggested a weekend of camping and fishing, I jumped at the chance. He grew up in the area about an hour outside of Toronto called Flamborough. It's really beautiful. Loads of lush forest, farmers fields, and small rivers and creeks. We decided to camp and fish along the creek called Grindstone Creek. It's close to some wetlands and the fishing is supposed to be great. We ended up setting up our camp in what was probably a farmer's field bordered by a gorgeous forest. We spent that evening fishing, shooting the shit and drinking some quality craft beers. As it got darker, we made a little fire and roasted potatoes and hot dogs. All in all, it was a really good night. We turned in just after midnight. We shared a tent. My buddy fell asleep before me and I stayed up playing on my phone until probably about 1.30. I must have drifted off because the next thing I remember being woken up by a high pitched yippy type noise. I was kind of groggy and it took me a minute to fully wake up. The yipping was incessant and it sounded like a weird coyote. I laid there for a moment listening and then started playing on my phone again. 
The noise was annoying as hell. I tried ignoring it, but it sounded like it was getting closer. Finally, it sounded like it had to be no more than 10 feet from the tent. At this point, I was getting a little unsettled. I had seen coyotes in Calcary before. I thought of them as pretty harmless. It never looked much bigger than a smallish dog, but what if this one was rabbit or something? What if it could smell our food? I have pretty bad anxiety disorder, so I'm prone to worrying about these types of things. I nudged my buddy to see if he was awake. He was. That noise had woken him up too. We discussed what to do about it, as we hadn't brought anything to scare off critters. Not a BB gun, nothing. Finally, he decided he would shine the flashlight on it and holler a lot, hopefully scaring it off. He unzipped the tent, and I watched him point the flashlight out into the darkness. I'll never forget what happened next. His legs suddenly went all wobbly, and he stumbled backwards into the tent. He had a really dumbfounded look on his face when he looked at me and babbled. It's, 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 it's not a coyote. It's a, it's, it's a dude. It's some weird dude. Normally, I would have thought he was messing with me, but I've never seen someone look that scared. I never want to see that expression on someone's face again, so I knew he wasn't pulling my leg. That weird yipping and howling type noise was still going on. And in retrospect, it really didn't sound like a coyote, but I guess in my groggy state, it was a way for my brain to make sense of it. Anyway, he kept telling me to just look out the tent flap. Just make sure he's not crazy. At this point, I was having a full-blown anxiety attack. My heart was racing. It felt like shit. But I had to look. I slowly peeked out of the flap. and waited for my eyes to adjust. And that's when I saw him. He was only standing a few arms linked away from the tent swaying a little, wearing a baseball cap. What made it awful though, what was really creepy, was that he was wearing women's lingerie. And that's when I knew there was most likely something very wrong with this guy. After I pulled my head back inside the tent, my buddy and I were discussing what to do. Finally, we decided to yell at the guy to f off. My buddy started yelling, Uh, excuse me, can you f off? We're trying to sleep in here. The noise stopped. It was dead silent. And that's when we heard footsteps running toward the tent. We stopped right outside the tent, but we didn't waste any time, and we started yelling again. Seriously, fuck off. We have cell phones in here. If you don't fuck off, we're going to call the cops. With that, we heard him walk by the tent and head off, sounding like he was moving towards the road now. Needless to say, we lay awake, petrified until the first sign of light. We hightailed it the hell out of there. We discussed our experience on the way home, and we were both pretty embarrassed about how scared we both got. It definitely wasn't manly on either of our parts. I think because we were both ashamed of how we let some weirdo freak us out so much. We really haven't talked about it since that day. So, there you go. That's my weird story. I'll always wonder what the hell that guy was doing out there, or what was wrong with him. Sometimes I wonder if things would have turned out differently if we were a couple of girls. I'm not saying he was some kind of serial killer, but it seemed like he was testing who was inside that tent. Guess I'll never know. And for that, I'm kind of glad. I fell asleep in my tree stand about 5.15 a.m. I usually don't fall asleep in the stand that easily. You walk into your stand before the sun rises on opening day. So you're in the stand when the deer start to get to moving. They're probably already up and about, but it usually gives you a better chance of sneaking in without spooking them too much. It was a 40 minute walk into my stand for reference. I'm suddenly startled awake to the most violent screaming noise any creature can possibly make. Then I feel my stand jolt a bit. I looked down to see a very sickly looking black bear fighting with six or seven coyotes. Actually for a brief moment I doubted what I was actually seeing. For maybe the three whole seconds it didn't even look like a bear, it looked like something else. I can't explain the feeling but it was a deep feeling that scared me. I've only felt it one other time. I just remember my arms going numb for a moment until I realized what was happening. They had bumped into the bottom of my stand ladder while tumbling with the bear. It was a terrible thing to see, just sitting in the tree thinking, do I put this bear down? 
do I sit here and just let this happen for who knows how long? I stupidly decided I shouldn't interfere. I just sat there. I put my earplugs in, covered my ears. It probably went on for a good 30 to 40 minutes. I have heard deer get taken down the same way, but this bear was making noises that I'd never heard before. That bear tried to fight, but all the nipping from the dogs was just, it was terrible. It was like a game to the coyotes. I tried to not look, but the few glances I took, I ended up regretting. This bear had very little hair. Something was definitely wrong with it. It was really skinny. Look up what a bear looks like without any hair. I had to sit there as this poor thing was just picked apart. You would think an animal would die when most of its face is hanging off and half of its guts are strewn about. I guess not. The worst part was that it actually never died throughout the entire ordeal. When I stupidly decided I couldn't handle it anymore, I scared the coyotes away and put it down. I regret not doing it just from the start, but I didn't have a bear tag. And I didn't want to get in any trouble, even though no hunter would ever shoot this poor animal to actually harvest it. If I was going to do that after this whole mess, why didn't I just do that from the start? I sat there thinking, letting this nature do its thing was the correct decision, but I still really regret it. I could have saved that poor bear so much grief. It's not like the coyotes are any threat to me whatsoever. I also had no idea coyotes could be that crazy. I was only 17 at the time, and sometimes I hear those screams in my dreams. It really sucks. Surprisingly enough, that experience bothered me more than when I thought I heard my buddy calling my name when we were camping. The problem is, my buddy was passed out drunk in his truck, back at the road, and I was at our camp by myself all night without even realizing it. I thought he was in his tent the entire time, but nope, I was alone. He had stupidly walked to the dirt road about two miles back by himself at 1am to sleep in his truck, because he told me he felt weird. Ever since then, I've always had this uneasy feeling in the woods at night. Even if I have a semi-automatic 12 gauge loaded with 3 inch slugs, with a 3k lumen flashlight attached to it, sitting right next to me. It's just a hair raising uneasy feeling. I wish I could go back to the total calm I used to feel out there. It's like something in my lizard brain was woken up that night. Like I was the prey, and I was used to always being the hunter. It definitely wasn't a good feeling. I'm absolutely sure that something was out there. I could feel it. Again, I can't explain it, but I just know. Something was staring at me. It definitely wasn't a coyote or a bear. This night started in the city but ended up deep in the woods. I wanted to put that out there not to break any rules of this sub. This is true and I will obscure the locations for personal safety and I apologize for the length. I'm originally from the northeast but I couldn't stand the winters so I went south for college. I was enrolled in my first year of university in the southern part of the US. The university was in a small city town and going out to drink was the main thing that everyone did. I was out with some other guys, playing pool at a small dive bar. An older guy came up and started talking to us, asked if he could get in on the game. I'll refer to him as Brian. I was 22 then, and he looked a bit older, probably in his late 30s. We played a few games, and he commented about a bonfire party happening just outside of town. He mentioned that there were some girls he worked with hosting it, and asked if we wanted to go. My friends declined, but I was single, so I said sure. As we left the parking lot in his truck, he said he needed to swing by his apartment and grab some liquor. This is when things got a little weird. I remember getting in the car and pulling out of the parking lot and then pulling up into an apartment complex on the outskirts of town. The bar was in the downtown area, and we were far away now on the outskirts. I wondered if I nodded off on the ride because I don't even remember the drive. I started questioning myself when he said that he would go inside, get the booze, take a shower, and then change his clothes. He offered for me to come inside too. The inside of his apartment was empty. No furniture, nothing was hanging on the walls, just open and empty rooms. He didn't say anything about it so I asked if he had just moved in. He said yeah, and then walked back to the bathroom without saying anything else. I thought about just leaving when I heard him get in the shower. 
Something about the situation was just starting to creep me out. I was sizing him up in my head, thought I could take him if some weird shit went down. I remember him mentioning the girls in the bonfire, so I decided to hang around and see where the night went. The shower stopped, he walked out wearing different clothes a few minutes later. He had two bottles of whiskey, and he looked at me and said, Ready? We jumped back in his truck and pulled out. I made a conscious effort to stay awake and alert. We left the city limits and headed outside of town on a dark back road. We were still on a main road, but were far from town now, and the closest city that I knew of was an hour away in the opposite direction. There were fewer and fewer houses as we drove. The places I could see looked like decrepit old shacks. I had lived here for a couple of months, but I've never been out this way. We continued to drive for a while, and I asked a few times if he knew where he was going. This was the middle of nowhere now. I didn't see any houses, and it was just thick woods on each side of the road. I didn't see him reading off any directions or anything. I saw a small parking lot with a gas station and a turnoff. A lone street light lit the gas station. Two pumps, and they both looked ancient. And a red neon sign saying 24 hours. The building was a double wide trailer converted into a store. We turned off onto the side street and kept going. This road was even worse than the main road we were just on. There were no street lights and it was very narrow. It twisted and turned, snaking through the woods. Still no houses visible, but I would see an old mailbox every once in a while. We came to the top of the hill and there was a driveway. I asked again if he knew where he was going and he just chuckled. I was in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by woods with some dude I didn't know. Fear did start to creep in. It wasn't at a house, it was more like a garage or industrial building. There were no lights inside or around it, and no motion lights as we drove up. No other cars or people. Where's the bonfire? I made my tone sound direct as possible. He just said, back through the woods. We drove past the building, around the back, toward the woods. As we got closer, I could see a small path, and as we went through, branches scraped alongside the truck. After what seemed like forever, the trail opened up into a clearing. I could see a few other trucks and people. Relief washed over me. I grew up in a city and wasn't used to shit like this. I started to think I was just being uptight, and I needed to chill out. It was past midnight and we left the bar around 10, so it felt good to finally get out of the truck. I scanned the group of people, but could only see a few girls. A couple of guys were building a fire trying to get it going. There were maybe 25 to 30 people there. A guy who was introduced as Mike walked up to us and to greet Brian, but he was staring at me the whole time. He never once stopped staring at me. Brian said he needed to take a piss and walked off. And Mike asked if I wanted a beer said to hang tight and walked away. Came back moments later and handed me an open bottle. I said thanks and started to make small talk, but he just turned and walked away. I started to look around and something just seemed off. There was no music playing, no lights, no liveliness to the conversation. The people at this party seemed diverse in age. I was wondering how they even knew each other because no one was talking. They were all just standing together in small groups and mumbling. Each time I approached a group of people, they would all stop talking and just stare at me. It was very standoffish and extremely uncomfortable. I just found myself standing alone and looking around for Brian. Couldn't see him anywhere. I looked around his truck but didn't see. By this time, I've had enough of this weird shit and was ready to go. I kept scanning around looking for his truck but it wasn't there. I didn't hear any vehicle start up or come and go while I was walking around turned back towards the bonfire and saw everyone was now looking at me together. All 30 or so people were now in one grouping, and they just stood there, no talking or movement. They were just standing completely still and staring at me. The bonfire glowed behind the group, making the moment feel very surreal. I stood there awkwardly and started noticing that their faces were changing. Their expressions rapidly changed from smiling to frowning eyes wide to snarling grimaces, but as I focused on one of them to see if that was what was really happening, the face would appear blank and expressionless. Suddenly one of the men started walking toward me with a deliberate pace and I turned and just ran. 
I ran up the path out of the clearing as fast as I could. My adrenaline was surging, and I kept running. I couldn't hear anyone coming up behind me or any vehicles, but I knew I could not stop and needed to put as much distance as possible between them and me. I started to panic as the trail broke off and went different ways. Didn't remember that from driving in, I just kept running. Finally, I saw the building through the trees and felt some sort of relief. I stopped just before the edge of the trail. It was late fall and brisk, but I was burning up. I was wearing a flannel and jeans with boots. Not very good for running. I was sweating like a pig and I needed to catch my breath. I couldn't hear anyone coming up behind me on the path or still hear any vehicles in the distance. And the light from the bonfire wasn't visible anymore through the thick woods. As I crossed the lot and passed the industrial building toward the paved road, the lights came on inside. A second wind of adrenaline took hold and I ran towards the paved road and just kept running. My feet felt like lead, and my legs burned, but I kept running as long as I possibly could. Finally got tired and moved off the paved road into the bush to hide and catch my breath. I didn't see any headlights still, so I went back to the side of the road and began jogging. I was on high alert and kept glancing behind me, but never saw anything. I reached the end of the road, which connected back to the main road and that gas station. I went inside, and an old guy sat at the counter watching a small TV, and he asked if I was alright. I told him I needed to use the phone. He laughed and said, Where'd you come from? I was out at a party and got ditched. He laughed a little and then gestured toward the phone on the wall. I could see he had a gun on his hip and probably thought I was a tweaker come to rob him. There was a phone book by the phone. I called a taxi to come pick me up. An hour later, I was back in my dorm and went to sleep. I never saw Brian again. I drove past his apartment complex but never saw his truck parked there. I never saw it around town or back at that same bar either. I'll never forget it, it was an off-white single cab Chevy, a late 80s model with a skull sticker on the back window with Roman numerals on the forehead. My curiosity got the best of me a few times. I drove toward the small gas station, followed the road to where the shop was and found it. I drove out there a couple of times, and each time there was no one there, and no cars in the lot. The building looked even shittier in the daytime. I left and drove back to town. This happened in the fall of 2004. I still get creeped out by it. This might not be your typical creepy encounter, and please delete if it's not allowed here, but this kept me up for a few nights now. For some background, I'm a male in my late 20s, living in northern Canada. Last weekend, I got a call from a friend telling me while riding his ski doo he went by my cabin as it was on his route. He said it looked like somebody had broken inside, smashed out all my windows. I was devastated and went out to my shed to load up my own ski doo and sled with boards and tarps to repair the windows, and hopefully to keep some of the snow out of my cabin until I can properly replace the windows in the spring. Just as I was about to leave, I got this gut feeling that something was really wrong. That I should take a rifle just in case. Better safe than sorry. As I started the ride into the woods, I noticed the sky was getting darker and darker. And I thought to myself, great, now I'll have to deal with the storm too. Luckily it wasn't a snowstorm, but a thick fog that just rolled in. There's nothing more unsettling than being alone in the woods, encased in a thick fog especially with God knows what around you. I finally get to my cabin, and sure enough, every single window is smashed. I unload my gear and get to work, trying to secure my cabin as fast as I can and get the hell out of there. At some point, I feel like I'm being watched, which gives me a lump in my throat because I can't see anything in this fog. I hear something moving in the trees. I automatically grab my rifle and put my back to the cabin hoping that if something comes out of the fog, I'll be ready for it. My initial thought was it was the asshole who broke into my cabin, coming back under the cover of the fog to see what else they could take. But then I realized that no skidoo was approaching me. I would have heard one from miles away as it was so quiet out here. After waiting a while with no more noises coming from the woods, I get back to work. I get my windows fixed and return back to my skidoo to get the hell out of there. 
After a short ride, I noticed that something looks like potholes in the middle of the trail turned out to be polar bear tracks leading towards my cabin. A creepy feeling of being watched and the noises from the woods was a polar bear stalking me and was the actual culprit of the break-in at my cabin. What disturbs me most is that I would have never seen it coming with all that fog that day and my rifle would have been practically useless against such a big animal. To this day, I feel very lucky to be alive. My boyfriend and I went on a long month camping trip to multiple states. Everything had been going pretty well until October 9th. We decided to ditch our campground reservation and randomly pitch our tent near Albion Basin within the Uinta Mountains, not far off the Secret Lake Trailhead. We parked our car around 3 p.m. at the Albion Basin campground. Admittedly, it was a little intense because this was our first dispersed camping attempt and we had no proper backpacking gear. Upon arrival, we realized the area we wanted to pitch our tent was about two miles uphill. At this point, we started to express regret as we had a planned campsite in Nepi, Utah that we decided to skip on a whim. After grumping around a bit and having a large lunch to avoid packing food, we packed our backpacks with the best gear we had to get through the night as it was going to be 25 degrees. We set out up the trail seeing the occasional family or couple heading down the mountain. As we trudged on, we both started to feel strange, as if we didn't really know why we were doing this, as if we should have just gotten a hotel instead of trying to play backpackers for the night. We both felt like we had something to prove, so we continued. Fast forward, we made it up to the lake. So we finally make it up to the lake, totally empty, so it's nothing like the pictures. Disappointing and eerie, whatever. We keep hiking up in an attempt for seclusion and flat land, and we finally stumble across a decent space. I see a cave in the distance and pointed out to Jason to deliberate if it's a hell no kind of situation. But after he checked it out, he says it seems like a small animal crawl space, no biggie. We set up as nightfall was quickly approaching. We played some cards, then bundled up and decided to go to bed around 8.30 p.m. as we planned to leave as soon as possible in the morning, maybe 5. We both start to dwindle slowly, after what feels like maybe 30 minutes. I woke abruptly at 11.24 p.m., with a feeling I've never experienced before. I woke up completely wide awake, scared but unprovoked, as if there was no way in hell I was going to fall back asleep, which is weird because I always sleep through the night. Jason was asleep, so I just let him lie there, alert, trying to listen to anything I could hear, which was nothing, very silent. Around 12 a.m., Jason woke up stirring, much to my delight, as I did not want to feel alone anymore. I told him I couldn't sleep, but he suggested I just rest my eyes as we were leaving early in the morning. I agreed, initially not wanting to be a baby, and just say I was very scared. This was very short-lived, however and Jason couldn't fall back asleep himself. So we both ended up lying there together, trying to sleep. I ended up blurting out that I was scared. We agreed to just stick it out through the night, as it was now approaching 2.30 a.m. We had a small axe and a pellet gun for protection, so I did not need to be frightened. Not even five minutes later, Jason's head perks up so fast my heart jumped out of my chest and I whispered, What is it? He replied, Listen. I shit you not, we distinctly heard the sound of gravel crunching under our boots, as if someone walked up to our tent, stopped, and then walked off to the side of the tent. I felt the blood drain out of my face in an instant. In real time, all this occurred in no more than 10 seconds, but my mind flashed a million thoughts for a millisecond, and I was convinced maybe it was a ranger coming to tell us we could not camp there. So I called out, Hello? I am entirely sure I heard human footsteps. Within two to three seconds of hearing those footsteps, Jason grabbed the gun and burst out of the tent for any chance to confront this person. As I knew, he heard exactly what I did. Nothing. There was nothing there. We heard something walk up so clearly, but it never walked away. Hardly exchanging two words, we immediately packed up our stuff looking over our shoulders the entire time, terrified, feeling watched 
booked it down the mountain with only moonlight guiding our way. Too scared to even turn on our flashlights. This is easily the worst 20 to 30 minutes of my life, half expecting to look over my shoulder to find someone following us. We finally made it to our car. We locked the doors and started the descent out of the mountains, completely speechless and scared out of our minds. We finally reached the town around 3.30 a.m. and slept in a well-lit parking lot of a grocery store. We've obviously since discussed what happened that night. We're both completely haunted by the sounds of those footsteps. In the summer of 2012, I took a job as an expedition canoe guide on the Boundary Waters in northern Minnesota, Quetico, southern Ontario. These are massive wilderness areas of lakes and lands. I was working for the Boy Scouts and we were based in Moose Lake on the US side. My job was to facilitate a fun and safe multi-day trip anywhere from 7 to 12 days out. Most of that summer was typical, but the one expedition in particular that still haunts me as a result of what happened to us over the course of a few days. Here is the account in full. My crew was on the younger side. There were nine of us total. The maximum allowed in a group per hour permit. There were six scouts and two adult supervisors. And myself. They had wanted to do a 200 miler but didn't have the physical ability so we had to amend our route. They were bummed out so I decided to take them to a waterfall called Eddie Falls. It's pretty flat up there. So there's a waterfall that is somewhat rare, but that decision would end up putting us in the path of something. We visited the falls and camped near it that evening. I had the boys working on a camp set up while the advisors worked on fire for dinner. I was collecting firewood in a big tangle of downed trees, brush, and bramble. I could faintly hear the falls off to my left when out of nowhere, I hear the most unearthly scream or roar that I've ever heard. It stopped me dead in my tracks and I was completely frozen. The second scream was closer, and the third even closer than that. I couldn't see anything due to the thickness of the brush, but whatever this was was coming directly at me. By the fourth scream, I could feel it in my chest. I got nauseous and involuntarily barked at it. I've never before or since heard that sound come out of my body. The fifth scream almost physically hurt, but it snapped me back to reality and I ran back to our camp. My crew had heard it too, but what am I to tell them? I claimed it was a boar, but there's no boar up there, and the advisors knew I was lying, but didn't call my bluff. After dinner, they went to their tents and I retired to my hammock that was about 50 yards from camp. As a rule, I always set my hammock up at my head height, so it's about 6 feet up. I would use a tarp over my body and head to keep the morning dew off and the morning mosquitoes at bay. But the tarp wasn't strung up. That's important. It was just loosely over me. It must have been around 3 to 4 a.m. when I was awakened by what sounded to me like a woman sobbing. Not an outright cry, but a sob. At the same time, I'm hearing something walking through the thick brush down past my feet. So I listen totally still and quiet as it crosses into camp. I could hear the change from brush to granite rock, but could still hear its heavy footfalls as it walked right through the camp and on towards me. At this point, the tarp is still over my head so I can't see a thing and I don't know what to do. In no time, it was standing right next to me. I could hear the breathing, loud and congested sounding. I could smell the musk. I could feel its enormous presence only inches from my body, just standing there. Time to make a decision. I suddenly threw the tarp off my head, and as I did this, my left hand touched this thing in the chest. It was dark, but I could make out briefly a very large upright figure. The hair on it was long and coarse. The frame itself was impressive, like bodybuilder status, pectoral, is what I ended up touching. It all happened in a second, and as soon as my hand made contact, it bolted back into the brush with immense speed for such thick debris. By the time I got my headlamp on, it was gone. My crew had slept through all of it, so I read until the sun came up and decided not to mention it to anyone. 
The next day, we moved on to a few miles towards a base camp and camped on a small island. Campsites on the US side are designed by a fire pit and a grumper, which is a fiberglass toilet over a deep hole. When we were arriving, it was evening. One of the adult supervisors needed to visit the grumper, so we walked towards it. About two minutes later, we heard him yelling and he came running back to the camp, still pulling up his pants and said he'd just seen a gorilla run right in front of him. I asked if it was maybe a bear and he said absolutely not, that he'd hunted bear for years and that was no bear. It was a monkey and it was about nine feet tall. At this height estimate, I'm imagining being back in my hammock. If I touched the chest and it was about six feet off the ground, that puts the head close to nine feet up. Was it stalking us? Was there more than one? All the boys are now scared. It's time to mitigate. I suggest a night paddle. No one's sleeping anymore anyway. So we pack up and set out around 8 p.m. and paddled by headlamp for several miles. My plan was to get back onto Moose Lake and camp very near to base so we could be the first crew off the water the following day. Moose Lake is connected to the Newfoundland Lake and by a small pinch and a channel of water that's not very deep or wide. There's dark woods on both sides. We were right in the middle of the pinch when a rock the size of a baseball came flying out of the woods on the right side and narrowly missing the bow of the canoe I was steering. There's no cliff there. This thing was forcefully thrown at us from the tree line. At this, we paddled like hell. We paddled to the center of Moose Lake, tied all three canoes together, and we sat out there all night. With the sunrise, we paddled back to base camp and ended our expedition. No one wanted to talk about what had happened, and I was okay with that. They left for Oklahoma the next day. After they left, I went to work a shift in the canoe yard, helping crews offload. My buddy Justin just got back from a trip in the same area we'd been in. He was in Bear Loop. As I was helping him put the boat on the rack, I noticed that he had a distant look, almost a thousand yard stare. I asked him how his trip went. He said it was all good until they hit Knife Lake, Newfound Lake. He said that they were being messed with for a few nights on knife and then had a rock thrown at them in the newfound pinch. Sure enough for a solid two weeks after that, crews kept coming back from that area with very similar stories. One night, there was a crowd of us guys in the staff lodge swapping trail stories and these encounters came up one after another. Screams, rocks, sightings of apes. Then from the back corner of the room I hear a chuckle. It's one of the old veteran guides who'd been there for over a decade. All he said was, it's about time somebody else seen one. I asked how long he'd known that they were there for. He said, he's been encountering them for around 10 years now. And then he said, they talked to me. This shocked me. Like a language? I asked. No, they communicate telepathically. The less you acknowledge them, the less they'll bother you but they can read you, and they like it when you're afraid. It's a game to them. What happened out there is still a big question in my mind. I've always been open to the idea of Sasquatch. Their existence was never a huge stretch for me. But what really sticks with me is the way that that veteran guide spoke of their intelligence and the parapsychological abilities, that they can read human emotions as clear as pages in a book, that they know our species better than we know ourselves. I apologize if this isn't the right sub to post this story. And if people think it's better suited somewhere else, then please let me know. It's taken me years to work up the courage to post this story to strangers because the events that took place all those years ago left me puzzled and frankly disturbed. It's perhaps best if I provide some background and context because it may help strengthen my story and people will hopefully believe me. I know that a lot of people claim to have a true story about strange encounters in the woods and I don't want people to accuse me of making all of this up because honestly, I swear this really did happen. It's not supernatural, it took place during the daytime and the quote unquote monster is very much human. When I was approximately 13 or maybe 14 years old, it would have been 2003 to 2004, 
and went on a camping trip with my mother and stepfather and four of my younger siblings. We're not a very well-off family. In fact, we were actually quite poor. I never went on holidays abroad, and we would never go camping. If we did, it was usually to the same campsite, which felt like miles away, but in reality was just less than 10 minutes from the city where we lived. We had actually been there a few times previously, and knew the campsite as well as the surrounding area fairly well. It felt safe and familiar. On this occasion, everything was going pretty normal. I myself hated camping, but my parents would argue when it came to putting up our tent. It was just so boring being in the woods. I would normally be the one entertaining my siblings. I hated not having electricity and access to proper toilets and showers. It could be quite fun looking back, and I do treasure some of those memories I have with my stepdad, who is unfortunately no longer with us. Usually, we would go on long hikes or bike rides, with my stepdad using maps to charter our way to a small village, promising to get us all ice cream, which was a real treat, which we never really normally had. On this camping trip, we were going to go on a 10 mile bike ride. Both my parents had their own bikes, along with my sister and I. My stepdad's bike had the small trailer where my three younger siblings, all under the age of five, were sat. It was hard work going through these epic long rides, but I rather enjoyed being in the middle of the woods, surrounded by nature. We weren't in the middle of nowhere, but it was remote enough for it to be inaccessible to public transport. Only forest ranger type vehicles could access the roads we were on. They weren't real roads, like paved with tarmac. It was more like dirt roads, which were only suited for bicycles. During all the times we went camping, we never saw any other vehicles go down these roads. On this day, we were cycling down this road when suddenly we hear the sound of a vehicle coming up slowly behind us. My stepdad is in front of us when he tells us to stop and move aside to let the vehicle pass. There's a sense of urgency and confusion in his tone as he's unsure why there's even a vehicle here. The vehicle passes us and we are expecting to see a forest ranger vehicle, you know, like a, a 4x4 Land Rover type of vehicle. But instead, we see one of those station wagon types of cars. You know, the ones with the long body, large trunk, and the window. In the back of the station wagon, we see several large trash bags. It's a very strange sight. I may only be a teenager, but it's a sight that sets off alarm bells for several reasons. One, this is not a car that's designed for going off the road. As previously mentioned, we've never encountered any vehicle down this bike path. Two, the person driving is clearly not lost, as they didn't stop to ask for directions or anything. These big black trash bags look very suspicious, and by that point, they're all fully tied up like very tightly. We could all see into the back of the car, and I saw nothing poking out to indicate that it was like full of garbage. The driver looked very rough. I don't mean to sound rude, he just looked very mean. I can't recall his features exactly, just that he didn't look like a friendly person that belonged in the countryside. He wore dark clothing. I think he was clean shaven and had short hair. I wish I remembered more about what this man looked like. As if this incident couldn't get any stranger, what took place next has left such an impression on me that I still recall that sense of fear that I felt at the time. My palms are getting sweaty and my heart is racing just riding this post. The car drives on several more feet and the driver stops. What feels like the longest time in my entire life and nothing happens. We're just sitting there watching this car. My stepdad has now told us to remain still. He's very serious as he's assessing the situation. Then, the car's reverse lights come on, and it starts backing up to us. My stepdad goes into full panic mode, and he tells us, Run! We don't even get back on our bicycles to ride. Instead, we all flee on foot, running with our bicycles through the woods, until we reached a railway bridge, which we had previously passed over. We never looked back. I have no idea if the man got out of the car to go after us or not. I don't know if he just continued driving. I still have no idea who he was or what was in those bags. We never really spoke about what happened that day. I know that it was something serious enough that it scared my stepdad because of his response. And it's left me frightened about who I might encounter in the woods until this very day. Several years ago, 
my friends Sean, Melanie, and I got really interested in geocaching. They had a new GPS unit that they just had to try out, what with all its fancy features and light up buttons. We did a few local ones to get the hang of it, then decided we could totally handle the expert rated tough ones. This led us to northeastern Connecticut, called the Quiet Corner. There isn't much out there in way of civilization, just a lot of wooded roads with houses spaced widely apart and hidden in the trees. It was an overcast and misty day, which added to the isolation we felt from the world. We arrived at the first cache, which was in the middle of a one-way bridge. The bridge connected two causeways in the middle of a wooded pond and had steel guardrails. The cache was attached to the rail by a magnet, dangling it out over the water. It took us around 20 minutes to find it. And during that time, a car driven by a disheveled older man drove by three times. The first time we noticed him because he looked unkempt. The second time we figured he was lost. The third, because we got chills down our spine. We had just found the cash and our thoughts changed from hooray, we win, to let's get the hell out of here. Unfortunately for us, this was what was known as a multi-cache. You had to find the first one, then it gives you coordinates to the next and so on. The next cache was a few miles away and we were more than happy to leave our current location. We arrived at the second location, miles through the woods, near the Rhode Island border. We were very close to a state park and being on the border meant even less civilization. We got out of the car and searched the short way down the abandoned rail line to find the cache. While we were in the trees, we heard only a single car go by and headed deeper into the woods toward the border. The cache was easy. As we got back to our car, a vehicle approached, coming from the direction of the border, and began to slow down. It was him, miles from where we'd been last. He'd obviously been the car that we'd heard drive by a few minutes earlier as well. It was at this point that serious concern set in. Who is this guy, and what does he want with us? Thankfully, there were a few houses around, so we drove off. We assumed whatever he was planning that he wasn't going to do it in front of witnesses. We decided to plug in the next set of coordinates and take a very roundabout route at high speeds with the hope of losing him. Sean is a bit of a maniac driver anyway, so you can imagine the whiteness of our knuckles as he kicked it up a notch. I swear, if I ever get stupid and find myself needing a getaway driver, I'm calling him. After a while, we all figured we'd lost him and we get to our next destination. It's another section of the rail trail, miles from the first two locations. No one behind us. No signs of anything remotely human except our own car. We're in the deep woods on a road that started as pavement and has now turned to dirt. Just us and the trees in the fog, which had settled in harder on the drive over. We get out, and I feel as though we're finally safe. We begin to walk into the woods and get maybe a hundred feet into the trail when we hear the sound of tires on gravel. Quickly, we darted off to the side of the trail and hide in the bushes. It's him. It seemed to take an eternity for his car to drive by as he slowly inspected our vehicle. Finally, he drove away, down and around a bend in the road. And we could see several hundred feet down the road where he disappeared to, so we knew we only had a short amount of time to get out of there. We jumped out of the bushes and ran for the car. We leapt in and tore off up the road in the opposite direction. Fortunately, my brother-in-law's parents' house was very close by, and we knew that they were away on a cruise for a week, so we could not seek help there. However, familiar territory does make one feel safer, so we pulled into their deep, long driveway and then hid the car behind some shrubberies. Before I go on, there is a great deal to mention about Sean. He is a huge dude, like 6'3". On top of that, his hair and beard look familiar to Hagrid from Harry Potter. He wears trench coats everywhere and is very much a fan of H.P. Lovecraft. He likes to read passages from the Necronomicon for random fun. He can be a very intimidating character to the uninitiated. Thus, it should come as no surprise to you that the trunk of his car was full of things, such as a baseball bat, several cleavers, a screwdriver that he'd ground down and fashioned into an embalming hook as well as various and sundry hatchets, all cast iron, all rusty. His car at the time was like a one-man traveling horror show. 
Once we'd hidden the car, we all grabbed various weaponry out of the trunk to arm ourselves with and waited. Five minutes later, our homeless-esque stalker had returned. He drove by three more times in the next ten minutes. After waiting what felt like an eternity, but was really only a half an hour, we finally decided that he was probably not going to return. We did finish the geocache, which actually had a few cool prizes in it, but we never saw our stalker again, which was probably the best for him. And Sean is very protective of Melanie, and probably would have gutted him on the spot. Still the creepiest experience of my life. My dad and I would occasionally go hunting together when I was a kid. I was 14 and my dad knew a guy who owned what seemed to be half of Georgia. I mean, the amount of property this guy owned was ridiculous. He let people hunt there if he trusted you, and if he liked you, he'd let you camp out there for a couple of nights, if you wanted. He always made sure we had a way to call for help though, before we did it. I loved camping out there more than I did just going hunting for a few hours, then coming home. I liked the woodsman feel of living out in the woods. We woke up early one morning and I hiked into the woods. It was still dark when we got to our stand. We didn't see or hear anything, not even birds. I remember my dad commenting on it, and looking back, it should have been a sign. Frustrated, we pack up and look for a spot to camp, and we would set up again later that evening. My dad suggested that we go deeper in, to better our chances of seeing something, so that's exactly what we did. We hiked for a few hours, found a clearing, and set up a small camp. Got settled and passed the time freaking ourselves out by talking about Bigfoot and other woodland creatures. We hike a ways away from camp, set up our blind, and wait. Again, nothing. We get back and our tent has been pulled up and laid flat. Not in a neat way, but it's just kind of laying there. We thought it was just the wind or something. We didn't put it upright and then maybe it collapsed. So in the moment, we really didn't think much of it. Since we didn't see or even hear anything all day, we decide to leave the following day and try again later that week. We settle in for the night, build a really small fire, and just relax. Again, not even birds are making a sound. I remember thinking how odd it was to be this deep into the woods and only hear one or two birds the whole trip. Oh well, maybe we are making too much noise and scared everything off. We go to sleep soon after settling in. It's pitch black, middle of the night. I wake up for some reason just to try to go back to sleep. I'm in that half awake, half asleep phase when I hear laughter. I kind of jolt awake, but don't hear it anymore, so I figured I was dreaming. I lay back down. A few minutes later, I hear it again. It continues and gets pretty loud this time. I wake up now, and this time my dad is up too. And he whispers and asks, Did you hear that? And this is when my heart dropped. I heard the laughing too. It wasn't a dream. We both heard it again, but it was faint. And now that I'm actually awake, I'm paying attention to it. It sounded like several people laughing in unison. It wasn't cackling or hysterical laughter, but just kind of normal laughter. It didn't last but for maybe five or six seconds long. And I've never felt that much fear before in my entire life. We didn't hear anymore after that. But needless to say, we didn't get much sleep. As soon as the sun came up, you bet your ass we got out of there. My dad was convinced someone followed us and was just playing some kind of prank. And that's why we didn't see anything. He said, while we were in the stand and blind, they were scaring off all the wildlife with their unmasked scent and being on the ground. He says this, but he didn't go back out there for over a month. When he finally did go back, he mentioned it to the guy who owned the property. He wouldn't let my dad hunt there anymore. Didn't tell him why either. My dad thinks he made the guy think my dad was actually crazy or something. Guess it's possible for someone to have followed us out there. We must have been legit ninjas though because we went out before daybreak. Nobody but the owner was parked out there that morning. There were dead leaves and sticks everywhere. And when they decided to laugh, it came from different spots. 
and I never heard one footstep. Sorry if this wasn't really what you're looking for. It's one of my best stories. Even if nobody I tell believes me, I still get goosebumps. I'm a summer camp counselor. I work every summer for a camp for five weeks. One time, we were backpacking to the tallest peak in my state. At night, me and a coworker slash friend went on a night hike to get away from the kids. We laid down on a slope in a patch of grass to stargaze about a quarter mile from everyone else. As we were laying, I heard the most beautiful sound of water behind me, and I mean beautiful. I've never heard water running before, and I thought to myself, wow, this sounds beautiful. All I could imagine was crisp, clear water gracefully trickling by. I had this image stuck in my head. I had this sudden urge to go find it as well. Not even just an urge, but a need to find that creek. Now behind us was a dense forest and brush, so it would have been hard to find it at night. But it sounded like it was somewhere close to us. Me and my friend looked at each other without saying a word, and I knew he was having the exact same thought as me. I said to myself, let's wait five minutes, then we'll decide if we should check it out or not. It felt like a playful presence was trying to persuade us to go over there. Then I decided that we should go check it out. So we stood up without saying anything to each other. It just sort of happened. As we were approaching the sound, it became quieter and quieter. We stopped, not knowing if we wanted to continue. As we stood there, the noise of trickling water became louder and louder until it sounded like we were standing next to a river. That's when I said, let's come back tomorrow and find it. We agreed to come back later. When I made that decision, the sound of the creek vanished along with the urge to go. There was only silence. The presence that I'd felt earlier suddenly became sinister. It was just this dark feeling of a presence, kind of similar to knowing when someone is watching you. Then I felt this fear slowly creeping up from my belly. We walked back to camp quickly without speaking to one another. And once we got back, we started talking about what had just happened. My friend had the exact same urge to find the creek and the same internal struggle fighting that urge to go and look for it. When we got back, it was like a trance had been lifted. And only then did we realize that what happened was not normal. We both could think clear now, like a fog had been lifted. That urge I felt did not feel like my own mind's urge. It's hard to explain. Like an urge placed there because once the sound of water stopped, the urge stopped. The next morning, we went back to that spot and went to the place where we heard that creek. We looked and looked but could not find any sort of creek or water. We later checked some maps of where we were and found more proof that there's no creeks or water even nearby. I'm scared to imagine what would have happened if we followed the sound of that water because of the ominous presence we both felt. If I was by myself, I would have thought I was imagining it, but my friend thought, felt, and experienced the same thing I did. I don't know what it was, but it was eerie to say the least. What's strange is neither of us said anything to one another once we heard that sound of water, and yet we both made the decision to go look for it without even speaking to each other. We both felt that sinister presence trying to lure us in, and I'm thankful we decided to go back the next day and didn't give in to the urge in that moment. I was in my last year before retiring from the army and was going through a divorce. My soon-to-be ex went back to Texas with my two girls and I planned to move closer to them once my retirement was official. I rented a small two bedroom in Tennessee in a town called Indian Mound. Indian Mound was out of the way and really isolated. My commute sucked, but it was cheap and peaceful. I had no neighbors. Across the street was a conservation land for miles. On one side and around the back of the property was a swamp. On the other side, the closest house was out of shouting distance. I enjoyed living there initially. Before this, I'd lived in the suburbs. All the noise, people, and traffic drove me absolutely crazy. One night, I came home around 1 in the morning from a concert in Nashville. It was early spring. It was somewhat foggy. 
The driveway dipped down, and the house was about an eighth mile away from the road. As I pulled in, I saw a huge black dog standing in the front yard. It stood with its head up, and its tail straight up as well, fixed on me. I slowly pulled my car up, unsure of what to do next, when it turned and ran into the swamp. Didn't really think much of it, and went back inside. Over the following few months, things began happening at night. I'd always wake up around 3 or so in the morning, thinking I heard voices outside my window. And sometimes, it sounded like people or a couple of people were whispering to each other, but I couldn't quite understand what they were saying. And sometimes, I would also hear footsteps and movement outside. I thought it was maybe a deer or that dog I saw, but when I looked out, I would see nothing. This type of shit continued on for months and months. Another night, I woke up to a noise and saw that it was 2.57 a.m. A bright white light shone through the porch glass doors. I ran into the kitchen and looked through a small sink window, and it looked like someone was out in the swamp shining a spotlight. It was one of those high-powered lights used in search and rescue. It was blinding and lit up the whole kitchen. As I opened up the back door and ran out into the porch, yelling I was going to call the cops, the light suddenly went out. I heard someone moving away from the house and back into the swamp. Cops came out and took a report, told me to ensure that my doors were locked and to call if anything else happened. I was hyper vigilant for the next few days. I checked behind me when I was coming and going. I slept with the shades drawn and doors locked. The footsteps around the house continued, and some nights I thought I could hear a dog panting outside my window. Although, I never found tracks or saw signs of an animal in the morning. Things did die down for a while, and I was about three months away from the end of my lease. I woke up about three in the morning, scared out of my mind. I was sleeping and I heard a woman calling my name in a dream. I opened my eyes and realized that it was a dream. But then I heard my voice get called out again, clear as day. I shot up, got out of bed, and turned on the lights. I checked in the closet under the bed. I opened up my bedroom door and listened out into the hallway. I couldn't hear anything now and was about to cut the lights and go back to bed when something pounded on my front door. I nearly jumped out of my skin. It was like someone was bashing the door with a sledgehammer. I yelled out that I had a gun and get the fuck off my property. I said I called the cops and I'll blow your fucking head off before they get here. The pounding stopped. Cops came out again and took another report. There was no damage to the door or any footprints around my property. It all just stopped after that and I did buy a 9mm, but the rest of my time renting there went without incident. I'm now back in Texas, in an apartment complex in the Burbs, and I don't mind. The backwoods of Tennessee were a very creepy place. I'll preface this by saying we were 12 and 13 at the time, when my friend and I often snuck out of either of our houses during sleepovers for late night walks. This was the basis of this terrifying encounter, and it stopped us from ever sneaking out into the dark ever again. My friend lived opposite of a huge forest, so her house was the preferred choice to sneak out. We always took flashlights, food, blankets, so we could quote unquote camp out for a couple of hours before going back home again. On this fateful night, we inadvertently fell asleep instead of staying awake, so when my friend suddenly jolted me from sleep, it was past 3am, it was a lot later than we normally snuck out, we grabbed our essentials and creeped out the back door into the cold and dark night. Frost crunched underneath our feet as we crossed the deserted road and reached the entrance to the forest. We began noticing how pitch black it was and how completely silent it was as well unnervingly so. We turned on our torches and stepped onto the uneven path into the forest. The light illuminating the trees swaying in the icy wind. We stepped onto fallen sodden leaves and bark as we made an unsteady but familiar way into our favorite part of that forest. A cold breath, the only noise to invade the deafening silence. We reached the small hut that we'd constructed one afternoon, made entirely of sticks, 
purely for the purpose of having some shelter for our campouts. There were times that vandals or other kids damaged our hut, but for the most part it stayed intact. But on this occasion, it was completely destroyed. We were just deciding to call it a night and maybe come back later on that day to repair the hut when we heard it. This loud, shrieking giggle that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. My friend and I jumped in shock and looked at one another like, what was that? We were completely freaked out. The eerie and unnatural giggle rang out again, contradicting the silence and making my body break out in goosebumps. Someone is in here, my friend whispered to me, looking utterly terrified. We have to go now. Her voice of rationale made it even more scary and unnerving to me that someone was in the forest with us at 3 o'clock in the morning. We just looked at one another and took off running in unison our footsteps navigating the path as naturally as we could from muscle memory, our uneven gasp of air punctuating the giggling that seemed to be following us, getting closer and closer. Our torches went up and down with our fast movements, illuminating random patches of trees and bushes as we finally saw a small sliver of light as we came back to the forest entrance. Running out of the forest, we didn't stop until we reached the back door of my friend's house and almost collapsed in a breathless heap of relief to be safe. Then my friend's eyes went wide and she nudged me, pointing a shaking finger across the yard. A haggard woman of undeterminable age was standing at the forest entrance giggling with that awful, horrifying giggle and was waving us back over. We screamed and ran inside and looked out of my friend's bedroom window through the smallest gap in the curtain. We could still see the woman standing there. Worse yet, she was staring right back at us, as if she knew that we were looking at her. You could tell that she was still giggling, a hideous, appalling laugh. She turned very slowly and walked back into the forest again. We never went back out to that forest, nor went out after dark ever again. Carolina, there's a town the army bought to use for training. They replaced the doors and electrical, but everything else they let go to shit. Which is very cool because the main house is over a hundred years old. It's getting to the part of the day where it's not that dark, but the trees are really shadowy and you can still see fairly well. It's a group of seven of us going to explore that house. Here's a first interesting thing. The legend goes that people coming out to this location would lose their keys and they would find them sitting on the hood of their car or inside their door. So I very specifically and deliberately waited until everyone was out and all the doors are closed properly. And then I hit the lock on the key fob and everyone hears and sees it lock. And then I check the doors again. Remember this for later. We all end up splitting into small groups and I end up alone. My wife and her friend go around back and I stay out front walking around and scanning the woods. They then come back, which is when they tell me that they heard what sounded like two little girls laughing and playing out in those woods. So I start walking around with the flashlight, scanning around. When we get back, the dome light to the jeep was on, and one of the doors was cracked. Shit you not. And this starts to freak everyone out. As we're all discussing this, we heard the loudest thud come from inside the house. I compared it to someone dropping a safe on the top floor of the house. It literally shook the house and I heard the bass in my chest. Now being prior military, I know for a fact that it wasn't artillery or any kind of ordinance. The rest of our friends that were inside the house beat feet. We got inside our cars and took off. No one could explain that noise. They were all upstairs and they looked into a bedroom and then went into another room, and then that's when the boom came from behind them. Many years later, we talked to those friends again, expecting them to say it was a joke, and they had done something, some kind of practical joke to mess with us. But they stood by their story to this day. When I was about 15 years old, 
me and some friends of mine decided to go camping at a nearby lake. It was a three to four hour hike and the nearest house was maybe three hours away. We brought some homemade wine and drank the whole night. We also ate some poorly grilled hot dogs. Life was good. We all shared a tent, so it was very crowded, but we all fell asleep around 2 a.m. At four, I wake up because I can feel someone running their hand down my forearm. Not that unlikely that someone brushes up against me, since there really wasn't any space to move around inside that crowded tent. But this is the arm that's facing the tent. So someone touched me from outside of the tent. I sit up and get instantly horrified as I see that all my friends are sound asleep inside the tent with me. I put on my deepest voice and shout out, Whoever the fuck you are, you need to leave. A manly low voice answers me. You should pack up your stuff and leave. Not threatening or aggressive, just calmly and in a dead kind of way. By now, all my friends are wide awake and just looking at me. No words, just pure horror in their eyes. I say back, Okay, we will go, but you need to leave. Hurry up. When we get out of the tent, this man, who is huge by the way, has taken the little rowboat that was lying at the bank, gotten into it and just sitting in the middle of the lake, watching us pack up our stuff and trying to get away ASAP. We had to walk around the lake to get back, and all the while he was just sitting there, watching us. We never went back there. This was 17 years ago in a rural Scandinavian country. We have a free to roam law, so we were not trespassing. We knew our way around the small town that we grew up in. Everybody knows everybody. There have been no people missing or found dead, never. There hasn't been a murder in generations. We told our parents at first, who tried to calm us down. They said that we were probably overreacting. But the way he caressed my arm before he told us to go was not normal. When we told him everything, and what he said to us, we were told never to go back. After COVID, we all met up again, and the subject came up. We tried to do some digging. There are no houses or cabins nearby where we were. The lake is way too small to fish in, and he was just sitting dead center with his little boat. There's maybe 60 feet to land on all sides. None of us has seen this man before or after ever again. I was backpacking with my dog and about 12 miles from the road and trailhead. So pretty far from people, though popular enough that other hikers might be around though we saw no one all day. About 2 a.m., my dog started barking this really low, deep growl and woke me up. I turned on my headlamp and see his teeth showing. He's right on top of me. I hear heavy footsteps. Maybe it's a black bear or a moose that's near the tent. I leash my dog so he doesn't tear through the tent and the footsteps move further away, but keep circling the tent. All of my food and toiletries are hung in a tree in a bear bag, nothing in the tent to draw a bear's attention. I clap my hands. Something is still slowly circling. Not something a moose would do, and a bear might if he wanted food, but I've got nothing and a really big dog with me. I decide to step out of the tent with a leash in one hand and bear spray in the other, yelling, Hey bear! The footsteps stop. My dog's nose is in the air telling me to look right but nothing in my headlamp that I can see. I didn't hear anything run off either, and it's quiet. I give it five minutes or so, get back into my tent, and it starts up again, circling maybe 50 feet away from me. Maybe an hour later, I hear the footsteps wander off into the woods. At dawn, I take my dog in the bear spray and start looking for the tracks. I find a clear path in the leaves that have been trampled, but no tracks. My dog's nose is on the ground, and I follow his lead. He follows the loop around our campsite. What we finally see is a few human footprints. Not shoe tracks. Footprints. A regular size, bare human foot. 
plus a human turd and toilet paper. Some a-hole was wandering around in the middle of the night, near our tent, and circling it for an hour or more, then left the dump for me to find. I've been doing this for decades, and this is the only weird experience that I've ever had. The hiking community is incredibly friendly. The trails have become more crowded since COVID, and you're definitely seeing more people on the trails and less trail courtesy, like litter and leaving dog poop bags, pooping too close to the trail or not burying it. Also, I was very far away from civilization. Bad guys don't hike 12 miles to do harm, and I'm pretty sure they don't carry toilet paper. The only incident that I know of was an emotionally disturbed person stabbed two hikers in the Adirondack shelter somewhere in the southern part of the Appalachian Trail maybe five or six years ago. I've hiked thousands of miles without a single dangerous human interaction. I also don't hike with a gun. There's too much weight to add for me on long multi-day hikes. I'm hiking in the northeast. The biggest predator to fear are black bear, coyotes, and bobcats. All of those are afraid of humans, especially this far from civilization. If I were in a mountain lion, grizzly, or wolf territory, I would carry a gun. Moose are scary and huge, and are not afraid of anything, especially in the full rut period when testosterone kicks in. You need a really big caliber gun to stop a moose from charging, and that's a heavy gun. I've crossed paths with moose three times, and they're so big, you can usually hear them crashing around long before you can see them. I've never had an actual stare down. My plan has always been that bear spray would disorient them, enough for me to find someplace safe. The biggest predator are humans. What do I actually think happened? As much as I'd love to say it was a young Sasquatch, a skinwalker, or a wendigo, I'm guessing it was some disoriented backpacker that left their tent to crap and got confused. I was hiking on a somewhat popular long loop trail, and I believe someone was probably hiking the opposite way, then stopped on the trail ahead of me. I was backwoods camping, not at a campground, and regulations are that you need to be 200 feet off the trail and into the woods to set up a camp. So they could have been a quarter mile ahead of the trail, and I wouldn't have known unless they were noisy. The most likely explanation is that they were heavily under the influence, got up to go crap and got lost on their way back to the tent, and somehow found my sight. They approached my tent and realized they were wrong, then tried to find their way back to their camp. Then they heard my dog and me yelling to scare off a bear, and either thought they were a risk to them, or too lit to answer back. The circle around my camp was several hundred feet, and my tent wouldn't be visible for most of the loop. I was camping between several spruce trees. I never got back to sleep. It was late September, and the sunrise was around 6 a.m. When I found the poop pile, I relaxed. I really didn't think there would be anyone nearby, as we were in a very tough area to get to, requiring going over two mountain summits from my direction and six other mountains in the other direction. The total hike was about 40 miles. We were gonna be out for three nights and four days. After I realized it was a human, my first assumption was that there was a lost hiker. I texted a friend that does search and rescue in the area to see if there were any reports of lost or overdue hikers. If there had been, I would have had my dog try to follow that trail to see if I could find their campsite. As no one was missing, we broke our camp and went our own way. My husband, kid, and myself live out in the middle of nowhere on a plot of land that's about 100 acres. I'd say about 95 of those acres are wilderness, with ATV and hiking trails that we and several other previous owners created by just exploring. We use that land for camping, hiking, and hunting. We like to find a spot, clear it a bit, and camp overnight. There's so much space that we've never stayed in the same place twice. We've seen some kill sites, both old and fresh, lots of animal tracks places where deer bed down, etc. I've even spent a lot of time hiking solo while the kid is in school and husband's at work. Whether alone or with the family, we always carry a firearm for protection. A few weeks ago, we decided to load up our camping gear and start a new trail. We marked the trails we make with spray paint on trees. We were pretty far into the woods, having hiked almost an hour, when the atmosphere seemed to change. I don't know who noticed it first, but my husband, who was leading the three of us, turned around and gave me a concerned look. The birds had stopped chirping. The insects went quiet. 
There is no sound all around us. When in the woods, complete quietness is rarely a good thing. We continued onward, hyper aware of our surroundings while our kid continued to merrily talk. We came to a stream that marks the midway point in our property. We stopped for a few minutes and my husband and I stared down one another. We both felt like something was off, but didn't want to scare our daughter. I finally broke the silence and said, I suddenly didn't feel good and that we should go home. My husband nodded in agreement, while our daughter voiced her protest. Too bad, kiddo. We turned around and started back. After going a few hundred yards, still quiet, silent wilderness, I looked to my right and saw a person crouched down in a ghillie suit about 150 feet off of our trail. I'm positive they saw that I noticed them, but they never moved. I cleared my throat to get my husband's attention, and when he looked back, I put my hand on the gun and the holster on my hip, which caused him to readjust his rifle in preparation of anything. I sped up my family and we hurried home. I told my husband as soon as we were inside. We decided to call the police and report the trespasser. Filed the report and was told to call again if we saw anyone. A few days later, my husband and I went out alone and set up a bunch of deer cams. We didn't go back into the woods for maybe a week or so. Then he and I ventured out to retrieve the cam footage. Of the nine cams that we placed, we caught the person in a ghillie suit in two images. We handed over copies to the cops to go with our report. We haven't gone back out since, except to check out the deer cams. I haven't gotten any other trespassers. It freaks me out even more to think of the few times while camping that we heard walking near our tent in the middle of the night. We always assumed it was just curious animals, but now, I'm not so sure. I live close to the Angeles National Forest. There are some trails within walking distance from my home that take you up into those mountains. It was a very foggy evening, and having just received some bad news over the phone, I wanted to clear my mind with a night hike. I set off around 8pm, sad boy music in my ears, and a camel back with water and supplies. I didn't plan to be out that long, but I was definitely going to be out for a while. The hike started off great, and the fog was almost sort of a novelty, very eerie and calm in a neat sort of way, the only sounds coming from water dripping off the plants alongside the mountain. Nobody around, and it felt like I had the mountains to myself. I was hiking without using my flashlight, as it was like driving. High beams of light cut my visibility from about 20 feet to 10 foot. Shining the light would be facing a wall of whiteness and would kill my night vision. After about an hour, things started getting weird. I was maybe two and a half miles up the trail, and the only light came from the glow of the city behind me. It was getting darker the further I got up into the mountains. I started smelling something. It smells synthetic. First, it was perfume for a few seconds, just a whiff. I couldn't see more than 15 feet or so in front of me at that point. So I was kind of like, huh? That's odd. The second smell was that of a campfire, which was also odd, as there wasn't any campgrounds nearby. I shrugged it off and kept going. I then got a whiff of a plant that brought me back to my childhood as it reminded me of smelling it during summers when I would play outside with my friends. I wasn't too put off, but indeed it was a bit strange. A bit later, I noticed a dull flash out of the corner of my eye. It was a light coming from a flashlight, but it was above me on the ridge, maybe 50 to 100 feet up. It looked like a glow in the clouds, sort of, like uh, how an airplane looks flying through. It would get brighter, then dimmer, based on direction. To my knowledge, though, there wasn't any trails there. Again, super weird. I took my earbuds out and listened. Still silence except for the light. The light would turn on, sweep, turn off, then turn on and shine in a different direction. Like someone was looking for something. I just assumed they were having the same visibility problems that I was. I stopped completely, watched as the light would continue to turn on and move, slowly along that ridge kept my earbuds out now and I was just telling myself it was another hiker. I waited for it to pass above me and just kept on. After maybe 10 minutes I heard whistling. 
sort of like someone calling a dog, but from a distance. I looked back, and while I was unable to orient myself due to the fog, the whistling was coming from the light that I could now see was across the canyon that I had been walking along. In terms of distance, it was probably one-sixth of a mile, just a faint glow through the fog. I watched it for a minute, then kept moving. After maybe an hour and a half, I stopped for some water. The trail had turned from dirt to the sandy, crunchy soil. It had only gotten darker, and I was now 3,200 feet in elevation, so the city lights were not as bright anymore. I noted that my footsteps were the loudest thing out here, which was a bit unsettling. The trail twists and turn along the mountainsides, and there would be these scenic viewpoints at turns that would give you maybe 50 feet or so to go off the trail and look over the edge into the valley. I was about four and a half miles out at this time, so I went out to the edge of the closest view to assess if I wanted to keep going or not. I felt great, energy and fatigue wise, and although my cell service had been spotty, I was trying to look at satellite maps to see what was ahead of me and maybe pick a turnaround point. I was also getting texts now that I hadn't been able to deliver since my service was in and out, so I wanted to check those too. I'm at the edge of the view, and someone had made a little rock sculpture thing with a weird stick. I took a picture of it. I was just chilling out there for maybe two minutes or so and looking back at that sculpture. I couldn't see the trail because of the fog and the darkness, but I knew where I was based on direction. And here's where my story gets absolutely terrifying. I pull out my phone to check my text one last time before setting back off, and as soon as I look down at my phone, I hear five very fast footsteps from the direction of the trail. That was the same sound that my feet made because of the soil. I recognized it immediately. I instantly looked in that direction and they stopped. Completely. Silence. I scrambled to get my flashlight and knife out of my bag versus using my phone light and fists and shined in that direction. A wall of fog and silence. The footsteps were not a gallop or the skittering of an animal. It was the footsteps of someone running at me on two legs that stopped on a dime. I could feel the terror rising up in my chest as I stood there frozen. I was alone in the dark, up in the mountains and something was up here with me getting goosebumps just typing this. Stood there for maybe two minutes with the light facing that direction. The biggest problem was that they came from the direction of the trail that I needed to go back. I thought, screw this. I'm heading back. I slowly approached the trail and walked through where that sound came from and began to head back down. For maybe the next 20 minutes, every two minutes or so, I would quickly stop and shine the light behind me. And I could have sworn maybe two or three times I heard an extra step in the distance behind me. Like something was matching my footfalls to remain undetected. I was fast walking now as the visibility was still too poor to run. And I was worried I'd twist an ankle or something. I kept my light on the whole time and had my knife out in the other hand. After maybe 30 minutes or so, I heard something crash through the bush on my right, which was the steep side of the canyon. Again, I cannot see anything because of that fog. I moved on the other side of the trail and just kept going. Let me tell you, that was the most determined I've ever been to make it down a trail. I heard other weird sounds along the way, but I ignored them and just kept moving. I will never forget that night. I night hiked one more time on the same trail, but it was a clear night out. I had a headlamp on the whole time and a much bigger knife on my side. I also ran back down when I reached my turnaround point. Sorry this was so long, but one paragraph wouldn't do the experience justice. Any questions, just let me know. I've shared this before, but here it is again. My memory is a bit creative, but this is my recollection. Some 15 years ago, I was hiking in the Himalayas. We were a group of 30-something if I remember right. We would trek the whole day, and at sundown we would camp, repeat the same day, gradually gaining altitude. The camps were all at designated sites, as we got to the higher camps, were fenced and manned by the army too. So somewhere on the fifth day, I got a bad stomach. In the middle of the night, I had to answer nature's call, so I asked my buddy to join me, and we walked to the watchtower where the army personnel was deep asleep with a thick blanket. He didn't wake up, so we didn't bother and decided to jump the gate. The gate 
was just chained, not locked. We unchained it and went out. We could see the Milky Way from there. I answered nature's call next to a glacier that had come sliding down the mountains, clearing the forest on its way. It was a moment to live for. The pristine air, water, and such galaxy-studded sky. I still think of those views. Anyway, we were taken in the stars. I finished my business and we start walking back to our tent, still mesmerized by the sky. Just then, you hear the whistle blow. The night watch is awake again. We were strictly told before that, that after lights out, no one gets out of their tent or any activity. So we kind of start panicking and not wanting to explain ourselves. We just get inside our tent and go to bed. We heard someone walk around our tent and we just lie there, silent, and try to go back to sleep. The next morning there's a big commotion. Some high-ranking army personnel is on the campsite. He's shouting and everybody assembled and is just listening to his bashing. The night guard got a sounding. Apparently, someone stepped out and left the camp gates open. A bear walked into the site but didn't do any damages. The foot marking around our tent and the whole camp sent chills to both me and my buddy. We were scared and didn't own up to our fiasco. To this day, only the two of us know how close of a call we had. I have a big respect for the wild now. Though this doesn't account to anything like a real life encounter, we were totally clueless. It was a bear that was just across our canvas and we'd assumed that it was the guard. I just discovered the sub and I have been reading your stories. Some are really quite frightening, but I have a tale from a long time ago that I thought I would share. I think it belongs here and I hope I don't bore you. I am now a 72 year old man. This happened a long time ago, but I remember it so well. The background was a series of events that placed me in a mountain cabin outside of Frederick, Maryland, circa 1969 or 1970. Just say my life at the time was in disarray. I dropped out of college. My father had died very badly and I was alienated. I needed to get my mind right. The opportunity to move into an isolated cabin, to live in contemplation and solitude was welcome. I had some inheritance money to pay for it. To the best of my memory, I was there eight to nine months. No TV, but books and radio. I had a library card and I can't remember if I had a phone. The story begins when a month into my stay, a female beagle showed up at my door. She was a lost dog and I took her in. Never could train her to do anything, but I fed her and she was sweet, if not the brightest dog. A few months in, I began to feel a presence around the isolated cabin. It's hard to describe, but I felt like someone was watching. On many occasions, I thought someone might even be looking in to my cabin window, watching us. The next phase was the shadowing or following. I knew the folks half a mile down the lane, woods all around, and would sometime visit them at night. Someone, or something, was waiting for me, and followed closely into the woods beside me in the darkness. You could easily hear it, the footsteps in the woods, it would pick up its pace as I did. This not only happened to me, but to my younger brother who visited, and to other friends, and it spooked them big time. At night. It was out there, around the cabin. Here's the funny thing. I was never afraid, never felt threatened, not at all, at least early on. There was no feeling of malevolence. I spent a good time wandering the vast areas of the woodland around me. There was a state park just up the hill, and the Frederick Municipal Forest went on for mile after mile. The whole of Western Maryland was much more country than it is now. None of the development had set in yet. In our hikes, the dog and I, we came across evidence of campsites, recent ones in the woods, traces of fires, old abandoned buildings that had corners that gave shelter and looked slept in, garbage and food and drink, paper and what have you, perhaps hunters, but much of it did not have the organized feel you would get from experienced hunters. During the last month of my stay, this was when things intensified. Maybe he sensed that I was preparing to leave. In the mornings, I would find small dead animals at the bottom of the front porch steps. The cabin had a small front porch, 
screened with a light door and four wooden steps to the ground. A spotlight would illuminate the long yard, with woods close by on either side. Dead animals began to appear at the bottom of the steps, many mornings. I remember small birds, then a squirrel, a rabbit, even a weasel one day. Like, they were offerings. I had to grab them up before the dog ate them. This went on daily for several weeks. One night, very late, I was awoken to some sound, lay in bed and heard something from the porch. I hopped up and hit the lights and then I saw that hound dog, who never learned to sit or stay, standing at the front door in a perfect point position. She was shaking with fear. She never barked. I heard the door slam and footsteps down the steps. I hit the spotlight but saw nothing. I went out. He'd been on my porch at my front door, maybe even trying to enter. After that, I stayed in at night more and more. The animal offerings got bigger and bigger. Larger birds, a possum, a woodchuck. It was not funny. The final two gifts were legs from either horses or cows, big and bloody. One was even skinned. The second to the last day, the dog left me. I could hear her in the woods howling on the trail, following a scent. I looked for her in every way that I could. I came up in following weeks, but still to no avail. She left just as she came. I ended up moving back to Maryland suburbs of DC. Got an apartment with a friend, got a job, and moved on with my life. One day, not long after I picked up the Washington Post, there was an article about recent encounters with the Sykesville monster. It described a tall, yeti-like creature, fur-covered on two legs, that would pick out family or a person and give them quote-unquote intention. I wasn't the only one. That attention described in that article was exactly what had happened to me following you at night, looking inside the house, gifts, and so on. I was shocked. If I had turned on that spotlight and seen a Bigfoot or a Yeti, I still might be running to this day. But I think I know who it was. Sykesville, Maryland was the location of the Springfield Hospital Center, a large state psychiatric hospital. It was 20 miles or so east of Frederick. Back then, Many folks knew how to live in the woods. They grew up that way, country folks. I think the monster was an escape patient or just a free schizophrenic who lived outside. This is just like all the homeless you see in cities now, probably off his meds, but somehow functional and lonely. He would pick people or families to adopt. The camps in the woods would have been him. Nothing to do, he would make mischief. I think he liked me, but sensed I was leaving. I can't prove any of this, it's just my theory. My monster was very much of that time and place, and his behavior was what I noticed in nearly every single case. I do not think he could have survived until the 1980s. The institutionalization of mental hospitals threw the mentally ill out into the streets and took away the shelter of hospitals. And unfortunately unprotected, the mentally ill die. My dad grew up on forestry in Queensland, Australia, as the son of a forest ranger. My whole life we spent a lot of time in that forest, camping and driving through parts of the forestry that only rangers would travel, and only occasionally. One place that dad loved to take us was this little farm in the middle of the forest that was impossible to find if you didn't know the way. Locals knew the place as Spike's Hut. Spike was a local farmer who had lived there for decades up until the 90s and had a reputation of being abrasive, violent, bigoted, and not concerned with the laws of men. He had a habit of approaching guys in bars who were wearing earrings and tearing them straight out, and there were a few stories about people who displeased him disappearing. Basically, Spike was not a nice guy, and his farm and hut reflected that pretty well. Dad would take us out there every time we visited the forest, and the hut would be more and more dilapidated, but the vibe was always the same straight up feeling of being watched, even though Spike was long gone. As I got older, I became more aware of the signs in life in the place when we went to visit. 
there would be 44 gallon drums full of smashed beer bottles, fire pits with reasonably fresh coals. Someone was definitely out there. God knows why, since the place was literally a snake pit at that point. But Dad didn't seem concerned. One trip when I was a teenager got strange real quick. My friends and I were all piled into my dad's 4x4, and we were driving through the bush to Spikes, so Dad could tell us scary Spike stories and freak us out. We drove onto the property, and something immediately caught my eye. Up on the hill opposite Spike's hut, there was what appeared to be a cowboy slumped against a log, a hat over his face taking a nap. Something about his body position looked unnatural and uncomfortable. It wasn't the way you'd be sat if you were taking a casual nap in the middle of a workday. And even if it was, there was no reason for anyone to be out there. The farm was long defunct, and there was no forest business to be taken care of on that property. I pointed it out to my dad, and instead of letting us out of the car at Spikes, as he usually did, he said he wanted to keep driving through the farm to show us something. He maintained that it was nothing, but that if the figure was still there when we came back through, we'd stop and check it out. Of course, whatever he wanted to show us seemed totally made up as he drove us through that forest. And when we came back, I spotted the slumped over cowboy again, never having moved an inch, still in that same unnatural position. I yelled out to dad to stop, reminding him of his promise. But instead, he acted like he couldn't hear me, locked the truck doors and drove off the farm much faster than he'd ever drove on those dirt forest roads. My friends and I all looked at each other in confusion, but we all knew when it came to this area, questioning my dad was futile at best, dangerous at worst. Dad denied that any of the events of that day ever happened after that, but my friends and I were still curious about what was going on out there. So a few months later, we went camping on our own and set out to find Spike's hut. It took hours of driving through the forest to find the gate, but eventually we found it without my dad's help. Something was off once we got there, more so than usual that day. My mates jumped out of the car but were suddenly frozen, not wanting to walk any closer to that hut, for no visible reason. Five was just wrong that day, and it felt like we'd walked into something that didn't belong to us. The tug in my gut to get out was so strong, I'd spent two hours finding the place. I was going to explore it, goddammit. One of my friends acted brave and walked from the car to the hut with me quietly acknowledging more and more the signs of inhabitants, with knowing nods between us. We said nothing to the others, but we were on high alert, felt like someone could be back at any minute, or that they never left and were watching us as we poked around the debris. We walked up to the side of the hut to find a small shed with three walls. I heard my friend's voice go squeaky as he called me over to look inside. On the ground was a huge pile of ashes from what looked like a cooking fire and confirmed this was the presence of a giant makeshift grill, made from cross-hashed wire, sitting over the fire and hinged to the shed wall. As I'm looking at this setup, I figure that whoever has been here has been hunting and cooking large chunks of their kill over that fire. Pretty clever, actually. But then, my stomach dropped. As my eyes traveled down the grill to the ground, I saw a baby's sock. Tiny pink and terribly out of place, then another, then a shirt, then a ribbon from a child's hair, all sitting right beside the ashes onto the ground, next to a woman's weekly Christmas cookbook. That's when alarm bells in my head went off, and I rounded up my mates to GTFO. Some ranger or crazy old bushy hanging out at the trashed hut was one thing, that there was absolutely no reason for a baby to be out there. There's no way anything good had come of a child's clothing right by a huge fire and grill. When we got back to the campground, we couldn't shake the rotten feeling of being watched. All of us were so unsettled that we packed up our shit and decided not to stay the night. When I got home, I told my dad about it. He shook it off, saying, Weird stuff happens out there. Being young and dumb, I never thought to look up missing persons in the area and make an attempt to either explain the cowboy or those kids' clothes. But I can tell you, I will never make the mistake of going out to Spike's hut without my father ever again.